waste not, want not. Your trash may be another's transportation treasure. Landfill gas that happens naturally and converting it to a fuel to actually fuel the trucks that haul the garbage is, is about the most exciting thing we've done in a long time around garbage. From garbage to gas. Plus, stinky ingredients. Olivia, do we have any, um, any sludge sitting around? Did fine. you just ask your employee for poop? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. A new brew for plastic, a wastewater wonder. And funeral plans good for the environmentalists and energy savers' soul. We're not robbing the earth of, of, of the natural cycle of life. Everything physical is always recycled one way or the other. Burials that benefit the earth. This is Energy Now. Hello everyone, I'm Thalia Shuras. Welcome to Energy Now, a weekly look at America's energy challenges and what we're doing about them. While our resources across the planet might be dwindling, there is something that we have plenty of, garbage. And the amount of trash we produce just keeps on growing and growing. On average, each of us in the U.S. generates about four pounds a day. That's more than 240 million tons of garbage a year, most of which ends up in landfills. And here's the energy connection. All that decomposing waste produces gases. Across America, that gas is being used to generate electricity. The EPA says enough electricity is generated from burning landfill gas to power more than a million homes. And now, some companies are using that trash to help fuel, well, trash pickup and cut down on the amount of oil we use. Peter Standring explains in this Energy Now Spotlight. You might say Gino Crusto has a dirty job. After all, he spends all week driving around the San Francisco Bay Area collecting trash. It, it definitely will bring the man or the woman out of you. I mean, I, I've seen big men cry. Despite the hard work, Crusto is no crybaby. In fact, he loves his job, especially his new truck. When I come home after working in a diesel truck, I smell like diesel. Unlike most heavy-duty refuse vehicles, this rig doesn't run on diesel. It's actually powered by gas made from trash. How'd it go today? Everything all right? Scott Gurman is a fleet manager with Waste Management Inc. The company operates the largest waste removal trucking fleet in North America, about 22,000 vehicles. Here in California, more than 1,000 of them run on trash gas, which is technically liquefied natural gas, or LNG for short. This year we did not buy one single diesel vehicle. They're all natural gas. The fuel that the company is using to power its fleet of waste removal trucks comes from this giant landfill, and it's actually a product of all this garbage. It's the Altamont Landfill, one of the largest in Northern California, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right now, we average about 5,000 tons of garbage each day. Jessica Jones is an engineer with waste management, which also owns the landfill. And this is the wellhead, the top of the well that collects landfill gas, anything from a banana peel to um, the leg of, a, of an old desk or chair that you're throwing away. That's all organic. And that's the material that breaks down when it's in the landfill and creates methane gas. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. And in the US, landfills are the third largest source of it after oil and natural gas industries and farm animals. By federal law, landfill operators have to destroy 75% of the methane they produce. But here, most of it, 93%, is captured and converted to energy. We can take what could be a bad thing for the environment and completely turn it around and make it an excellent uh, thing for the environment. So all of this trash here that surrounds us is actually a valuable resource. Yes, it is, it is. To fully harness that resource, the company's installed nearly 200 wells all over the landfill. The pipe has holes or perforations in it so that we can pull with a small vacuum, we can pull the landfill gas below the ground up into the well. From here, the captured landfill gas travels through a network of pipes. It arrives at this high-tech processing plant where it's dried and scrubbed clean of any unwanted gases like carbon dioxide. Once those gases are out, we have 
clean methane and then we have to cool the methane gas down to around 260 degrees, minus 260 degrees, to get it to liquefy. The gas is liquefied and turned into fuel, which is put into these massive holding tanks and then pumped into transfer trucks and hauled away for distribution. Landfill gas that happens naturally and converting it to a fuel to actually fuel the trucks that haul the garbage is, is about the most exciting thing we've done in a long time around garbage. Currently, waste management is producing 13,000 gallons of LNG from trash gas every day. Much of it ends up here at the company's Oakland refueling yard. At minus 260 degrees, the LNG requires special handling. Despite the risk of getting a little freezer burn, lead mechanic Mike Keel admits he's a big fan of trash gas. Well, it's quite amazing, actually. I mean, we're producing fuel that comes from the landfill. No major problems? No, no. Peter Ward, a fellow on the right, is with the California Energy Commission. His agency is a big supporter of LNG made from waste. It's clean burning, but it's also uh, from the carbon intensity, which is a well-to-wheels calculation of the, the carbon intensity of the fuel as delivered, is very, very low compared to any other alternative. In fact, trash gas gives off 80 to 90 percent fewer carbon emissions than diesel. And LNG is a viable, uh, economically efficient fuel. Richard Battersby is the director of a group that supports the use of cleaner alternative fuels. When you start looking at the numbers, LNG from landfill gas has the potential to displace millions of gallons of petroleum fuel. The infrastructure needed to produce trash gas is very expensive. This plant alone cost more than $15 million. But many alternative fuel experts, like Battersby, think LNG from waste makes sense. I fully expect to see more and more landfill gas to alternative fuel operations in the next five to ten years. So garbage trucks that run on garbage may be coming soon to a neighborhood near you. Proof that one man's trash really is another man's treasure. In Northern California, Peter Standring, Energy Now. The EPA says there are hundreds of untapped landfills across the U.S., so we calculated how much energy they might contain in our Energy Now reality meter. New landfill gas projects could produce enough energy to replace about 800 million gallons of diesel a year, or roughly 2% of what's burned by trucks and other heavy vehicles. Still, there are barriers. Natural gas trucks and fueling stations are expensive. But the natural gas industry says after those upfront costs, truckers will save money on fuel. It wants Congress to pass the Nat Gas Act, which would provide tax credits for buying natural gas trucks. A quick note, Energy Now's initial funding comes from the American Clean Skies Foundation, which is funded in part by Chesapeake Energy, a major player in the natural gas industry. We are editorially independent. Neither the foundation nor its backers control what we say or do on this program. There are other kinds of energy technology being pioneered at landfills across the country, including one called the Spectral Power Cap. It generates renewable electricity while covering up giant mounds of trash, and we went to Conley, Georgia to see how it works. What you're looking at is a, a first of its kind. This is the, one of the largest solar energy covers. I'm Tony Walker. I'm with Republic Services. Uh, I'm the engineering manager. Republic Service is one of the largest solid waste companies in the U.S. We came up with this idea, we call it a dual purpose system. We're not only closing the landfill, but we're also generating solar energy. My name is Art Moore and I'm the director of landfill solutions for Carlisle Energy. We are a manufacturer of the geomembrane that's used in this landfill. Our primary business is commercial rooftop business. When you fly in or you have the ability to look at a roof uh, that is white, that is generally a TPO thermoplastic polyolefin material, which is very similar to the material that you see here. The landfill industry, it has a, a stigma that's an awful place, it's a dump, you know, that's where all the waste goes. In, re in reality, this, the landfill is highly engineered. This is the protective layer. This keeps the landfill gas contained, this keeps the rainwater out of the hill, and also they can actually walk the facility and see where they might see a stress crack or something that's a flaw, we can easily fix it. Underneath this is about 9 million cubic yards of municipal solid waste. As the municipal solid waste breaks down over time, settlement occurs, so we need a panel that kind of flexes with the earth. 
We are shipping in photovoltaic rolls. We have factory bonded the photovoltaics directly to the geomembrane, and we unroll them here on site. We weld them together and uh, create a monolithic cover on this landfill. Every single one of these components are manufactured in the United States. There's about 7,000 of these unisolar panels on this hill. Each panel right here is actually 144 watts of solar. These are Teflon coated, very durable. You can walk on these panels. Uh, you can actually do the inspection of the wire system itself. You're looking at about a million linear feet of wire. That is a lot of wire. Each of these solar arrays are roughly 250 kW. That matches with each inverter. So you have four inverters rated for 260 kW. The system overall is operating at one megawatt in total. That will be equivalent to producing energy to about 224 homes according to the EPA calculator. We have a agreement with Georgia Power. We sell the power back to the utility at a wholesale market. That's a $5 million project. We awarded a grant from GIFA and they gave us $2 million to expand the system. We wanted to show the people who fly in this town every day how big solar can be in Georgia. We think that these type of systems can be built across the country. A lot of those landfills are actually built in an urban setting. And so they're close to the tr transmission lines. The technology is going to keep advancing. One day, we'll see this whole hill hopefully covered in actually a PV membrane. And so you won't see the stripes you're seeing behind me, but the, the membrane itself is a PV. That's the vision I see down the road. That massive membrane you just saw covers a total of 45 acres, but solar panels are only installed on 10 acres. There are only two others like it at landfills in Texas and New York, but they're a lot smaller and generate much less electricity. Still to come, you might be living an environmentally friendly life, but how about continuing to be green in the hereafter? We'll fill you in on climate-friendly burials and cremations, but first, Literally, we are brewing plastic, so it's very similar to brewing beer or anything else, so that's plastic. Goodbye oil, hello poop. A new energy efficient recipe for making plastic. We'll explain when we come back. Congress can't ignore the facts. More air pollution means more childhood asthma attacks. Log on to LungUSA.org and tell Washington, don't weaken the Clean Air Act. You realize that 49 million Americans struggle with hunger? That's one out of every six Americans. These people are around us every day. They're our friends, they're our coworkers, their kids go to school with our kids. Sometimes we're not even aware that they're struggling. This problem is closer than you think. But so is the solution. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. From landfills using innovative techniques to create energy, we're moving on to sewage. It turns out garbage isn't the only kind of waste that can help the U.S. reduce its use of fossil fuels like oil. While petroleum is used mostly for transportation, almost 5% of the oil we consume goes into making plastics, like shopping bags and water bottles. That's where the sewage comes in and out. More from Energy Now's Lee Patrick Sullivan in this Energy Next. Okay, there's no easy way to say this, but to just come out and say it. The folks at this lab in Northern California say they can make plastic out of poop. Well, you know, it's funny, a, a lot of these ideas that seem like they're really out of nowhere, they're sort of unusual ideas, um, have actually been incubating in the academic and industrial spheres for a long time. It's been known for some time that there's a chemical in wastewater that can be used to make plastic. And if you could extract this chemical at a reasonable cost, it could compete with the major source of plastic products, fossil fuels. The U.S. uses the equivalent of 300 million barrels of oil a year on plastics. But the folks at Micromitis say that could change. What we said was, 
you know, it looks like it's ready to go. Why don't we, there's a little bit of, there's a gap of engineering that needs to be done to bring it to commercial scale. Why don't we take that, you know, cross the gap, and then we've got, you know, we have something that's real. The something real isn't just an oil-free plastic. It's a technology that could turn the sludge that builds up in wastewater treatment plants into a valuable commodity. Are you getting tired of all those corny reporter yeah. puns that go on? No, you know, it's not. Because I thought of a whole list of them <laughs> on my way here. Like, uh, uh, do you consider yourself having a crappy job? If someone steals your ideas, are they stool pigeons? I mean, yeah. I have about 11 of them. Stool pigeons? I haven't heard that one well, yet. So that's an original. That's a good one. That's yeah. original, yeah. But if Bissell's big idea so takes good. off, he fun. may have the last laugh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wastewater sludge, that nastiness that settles at the bottom of these large tanks, is an expensive problem for sewer authorities across the country. Wastewater treatment plants, like this one in Sacramento, process more than 150 million gallons of wastewater a day. You can see the clean water here. This is what goes back to the river. When the treated water is released into a river or to the ocean, it leaves behind sludge that's mostly burned or trucked away to places like landfills or farms. The idea of taking wastewater sludge and turning it into a bioplastic is, is pretty, pretty nice. It's a pretty good idea. More than 4 million tons of sludge gets hauled away each year, costing sewer operators as much as $200 million annually. Mike Romitis says it can cut the cost of hauling sludge in half. You guys have some sludge for me to look at? Yeah, here we go. This is the stuff. So it doesn't smell that bad. No, it's really not. I mean, it smells a lot worse than this. It actually smells kind of nice. Did you just stick your nose in there? Yeah, no, 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 but no, it smells different. It smells uh, better, actually. Anything for good television. <laughs> not it that bad. bad. It's right? it, smell, it almost... Oh, oddly smells a little bit like melted plastic. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah, no. The liquid that's extracted from the sludge contains the molecules needed to make plastic. This is what it looks like. The step right after that, it looks almost just a little bit like a, like chicken broth. Like, okay, well, I bet you it doesn't taste like chicken broth. I've never tasted it. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> now, this is where Micromitis makes its money. They add a cocktail of designer microbes, or bacteria, to the liquid. And that's uh, literally, we are brewing plastic. After it's run through a so-called extruding machine, the plastic cools and can be handled. So this is this, what the plastic looks like. This was made out of poop. Right, if correct. It has a, the thickness of like a really thin windbreaker. Is yeah. That, that probably a good example? And actually, it, you know, it's, it's not I, good. I gotta smell it. Yeah, go ahead. It smells like plastic. Bissell says the company is looking for applications that don't require tough kinds of plastic, so don't look for auto parts to be made out of this stuff. Realistically, what we're looking for are tertiary packaging applications. Tertiary? What in the world does that mean? Tertiary, Latin in root, meaning third in line. Primary packaging, secondary packaging, tertiary packaging. Now another example of tertiary packaging is those little plastic rings that come on packs of drinks. And also the plastic that wraps products on pallets at just about every single big box store in the country. Here at this one Home Depot store, they get 25,000 of these pallets delivered every single year. That's a lot of tertiary packaging. Now, there are other bioplastics on the market, but they come from plants and are generally more expensive than petroleum-based plastics. Bissell says plastic made from wastewater treatment sludge can compete with its petroleum counterpart and maybe even come in cheaper. One good thing is you're never going to run out of raw materials, are you? One would hope not, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> in Sacramento, California, Lee Patrick Sullivan, Energy Now. A group of engineering and microbiology graduates from the University of California, Davis, founded Micromitis, the company in Lee Patrick's piece. The outfit now employs 20 people, and its product is supposed to hit the market next year. Now, you've probably heard the approval ratings for Congress are in the dumpster, but at least our elected representatives will be sending a lot less trash to landfills and creating energy in the process. That's what's in this week's Energy Now Hot Zone. 
Starting in November, 90% of the solid, non-recyclable waste from Capitol Hill is now hauled to Covanta, a waste-to-energy plant outside Washington, where it is burned to generate electricity. The architect of the Capitol, the agency overseeing maintenance and operation of the Capitol complex, says the House and Senate threw out more than 5,000 tons of garbage last year. And now all that congressional waste can be used to create energy. When we come back, a burning desire to be energy efficient in the afterlife. Some new ways you can continue to look after the planet even after you depart the Earth. The Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America has important information for the millions of people with asthma. You may not know there are two main causes of asthma symptoms, airway constriction you feel and inflammation you may not feel. Learn how to better manage your asthma by treating both main causes of asthma symptoms. Treating both causes can help prevent symptoms before they even start. And preventing symptoms could mean a smoother ride. For more information, go to asthma.com. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Welcome back. One of the hardest things to talk about in life is death. Now some people are not only talking about it, they're planning ways to make sure their passing conserves energy and protects the planet. Energy Now Chief Correspondent Tyler Suters has more on how people are taking charge of what they can do even after they die. This year almost a million Americans will enter a machine like this. A crematory. How hot is it in there? Right now it's about 1,680 degrees roughly. The Anderson McQueen Funeral Home in Florida handles about 1,700 cremations each year. And that takes a lot of energy, enough to power about 200 homes for an entire year. Our monthly gas bill, just to give you an idea, is about $6,000 a month. All those flames also release carbon dioxide. But now clients here can choose to cap that carbon. When something takes over a disease or an illness. You just don't really know how long it's going to take. Until his father, Pete, passed away this fall, Dave Cattare had never considered the environmental costs of cremation. My approach was hands off. I don't want to deal with uncomfortable subjects. But Dave found a comforting option, a more environmentally sensitive means of memorializing his father. One of the options was the method of cremation. You know, you flame or water, basically. Bio-cremation, brand new to the United States. In fact, Anderson McQueen has the first commercial bio-cremation machine in the entire world. The process is underway behind us right now. The process is operating right now, yes, sir. How long will it take? It takes typically about three hours, um, so very similar to the traditional, traditional flame cremation. A cremation with no flames and fewer carbon emissions. We still get the body to ash, but we reduce it chemically using a process called, genetically, alkaline hydrolysis. Sandy Sullivan runs the Scottish company that designed a machine called the Resumator to streamline the decomposition process. We're using the same chemistry as is used by nature um, and speeding that up. The body is immersed in a solution of about 5% potassium hydroxide and 95% water. That's heated to 350 degrees, speeding up the chemical reaction that decomposes the body. Sullivan says the entire process uses just 15% of the energy of a flame cremation, with just a quarter of the emissions. According to the company that sells the technology, a flame cremation emits about 400 pounds more carbon dioxide than a bio cremation. So if one million people chose bio over traditional cremations, that would be like taking 36,000 cars off the road for a year. 
a selling point that McQueen says is resonating with his clients. Well, I think it's going to become very big, uh, primarily for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, again, the environmental concerns that many families have. More uh, and more people are recognizing More and this. more people want to reduce that carbon footprint that they leave behind. Which is why there are now more and more environmentally conscious memorials. Each of these cement structures being dropped into the Chesapeake Bay will not only become a marine reef, but a green burial. Three days before the services at sea. Right now we're mixing the remains into the concrete. Cremated remains, stirred by loved ones into a concrete mix. That mix will be placed into a reef ball creating a new habitat for marine life, like shellfish. George Frankel started Eternal Reefs 11 years ago. We'll get growth on these within six weeks. We'll get measurable growth within two months, and we will really have meaningful shellfish population out here within a year. He says there are now more than 700,000 reef balls carrying created remains off the coasts of almost 70 countries. Bye, Mom. But maybe the most environmentally helpful burials involve nothing more than the ground. That's the premise at this green cemetery in central Florida. The Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery is, um, includes 78 acres. Freddie Johnson is executive director at Prairie Creek. The rules here, no embalmed bodies and occasionally no caskets. Johnson says that way the dead give back to the environment by returning their nutrients to nature. Everything physical is always recycled one way or the other. And everything here, from grave digging to casket lowering, is done by hand. Mother Nature does a very, very perfect job of uh, taking care of the recycling of life, which is a beautiful thing to me. Nature may be perfect at recycling, but maybe not as fast as human technology. This machine does in roughly three hours what Mother Nature does in months or years. Those people who want to express their environmental awareness and concerns in a very positive way on their exit from this life, this allows them to do that. So Pete Cadere became a pioneer. He was kind of an adventurous soul. In October, Pete was just the second person in America to have their remains resumated. A trail his son Dave is now considering as well when it's his time. Either alternative is not so hot, you know, <laughs> you know? But, um, but this seems to be the preferable, in my opinion, you know, and for many good reasons. In Florida, Tyler Suters, Energy Now. Not to be maudlin, but we thought you might be wondering how much green burials cost. Well, the Anderson McQueen Funeral Home charges $550 for a flame cremation, $650 for the bio cremation. That's within an overall funeral service package that costs as much as $6,500. For a burial at sea, the Eternal Reefs price tag ranges from three to $7,000, and a green burial at Prairie Creek Conservation Cemetery costs $2,000, most of which goes toward restoring the land. And that's it for this week's Energy Now. We want to hear from you. Reach out to us on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Search for us at Energy Now News. And check out our website for blogs and extras at energynow.com. I'm Thalia Shuris. See you next week. Mm -hmm.